Hi, everybody. This is Brian O'Haran. Just after New Year's. Happy New Year to all. I hope we have a good year. A lot is going to happen in this year, so let's uh, try to do well. Um, the agenda for this week is, uh, again, kind of short, but full of meat. Not much fatty here this week. Uh, first, I'll start out with a few comments. Then I'll talk about the major development financials, part two. Last week, we talked about a lot about the revenue from the condos and all. This week, we're going to talk about a little different revenue that's coming along with these developments should they get approved. And then I'll talk a little bit about the 08, 09 budget because that's upon us. And uh, by um, the middle of uh, in the first quarter next year, March 15th, we have to have the first draft of the budget presented by the town manager to the Board of Selectmen, which will also have the first shot at the new mill rate for everybody so they can get a rough idea. It won't be the final one, but it will be a good, uh, a good approximation. And then I hope to talk a bit about it. Uh, a bit about it, intermediate term revenue, but I I'm not sure we'll get that far. We'll give it a chance. So the first thing I want to do is I want to point out to you that um, if we can switch to the slides now over here. Thank you. Um, when I was uh, about 18 or 19, when I got out of high school in Thorrington, I went off to uh, a, an art school for a while and uh, starved there uh, for about a year and a half. Finally, uh, couldn't take it much anymore, so I put all my artwork in a portfolio, and I went around the streets of Hartford. I bought a suit and a pair of shoes from a friend and uh, got dressed up and took my art around Hartford. And uh, I went into G. Fox and & Company, and I got a job with, uh, from, a, from a mentor of mine that I'll never forget. Uh, his name was Ralph Daddio. I think he used to also be uh, in charge down to 17 Magazine in the, in the uh, advertising department there. Uh, I'm not positive. I'm still doing some research on that. I'm trying to track him down. He would be about 90 today, so it's not easy to find a picture of him, so I don't have a picture. But what he asked me to do was he hired me. He was a New York-type advertising executive, uh, AAA, if not quadruple-A personality, uh, really a hustler, and uh, he ran the advertising department at G. Fox. He asked me if I would do a season greeting card for Mrs. Arbach, who was the owner at the time. Her husband was dead by then, of G. Fox and Company down in Hartford. So I took the uh, commission, and I did that uh, season's greeting for him. And then he offered me a job at $50 a week. I lived in the, in the local YMCA in Hartford for $10 a week. So I had $40 a week to spend. And I did this uh, uh, cover for their um, 100th anniversary or something very close to it. I can't figure the dates there. But, uh, and the cover was done by, uh, by me. And... Uh, then I left for Kansas University, and I called the university, and I said, please get me the cheapest room you can. I'm on my way. And, um, and they put me under the football stadium for almost nothing, and then uh, I uh, sold drinks at, during the football games during some of my tuition. So that was what happened. But Ralph Daddio taught me that anything can be done, and you've got to put your mind to it, and you can try. When he first asked me to do this magazine at that age, I was amazed uh, that he would get, give me that authority and that responsibility. And then what they did is not only did they put this on all their magazines for Christmas that year, uh, it was I think 1958, uh, it's down here on the thing, uh, but they put it on all the shopping bags, it was on all the wrapping paper, it was on all the things that were hanging in the store. And at that time, G. Fox was one of the biggest stores in the area. So I was quite uh, uh, pleased. I didn't see it all because I had all by then taken off for the University of Kansas. Uh, the other thing I'd like to do today in the introduction is thank some other of my mentors. Um, they, uh, um, if you can switch back to me, thank you. You'll see them in back of me, I hope, by now. And that are a couple of rabbits. And uh, these rabbits were very, very instrumental in my sort of early years of uh, zero to six years old when my dad used to read to me. My dad read to us in our house, not my mother, because there were two boys at the time. My sister didn't come along for 12 more years or so. So my dad would come home from the factory, and he would read to us. And uh, one of the things he always read was uh, Howard R. Garris's uh, book about uh, the Uncle Wiggly long ears. Uncle Wiggly was a very ben beneficial uh, rabbit. Uh, he was always trying to seek his fortune, and he was very good to others. On the back of me, you'll see two of the book covers that I got recently from a, a, a lovely young lady at the library here in Winstead. And... Um, Bird's Leon Memorial Library in the children's room, and uh, she made a nice copy for me, colorful copy from the internet. 
Um, and Br'er Rabbit, um, one of the pictures here you see is him plowing snow for all his neighbors, trying to be uh, benevolent. And the other picture is he had made up a, an apple dumpling pie or something, and he was giving it out to a poor family of squirrels. So that that, that was always a, a main state of my impression. It was very impressionable for me as I was younger and grew up. I never forgot Uncle Wiggily and the things he did, and the fact that he was always out trying to seek his fortune. I think it might have given me some of my drive. Um, the next thing was Br'er Rabbit. You know, Br'er Rabbit was Cho Joe Chandler Harris stories, and uh, we were all familiar with those when I was growing up, no more today, but um, Joel Chandler Harris wrote the uh, Br'er Rabbit uh, into uh, his stories, and Br'er Rabbit, uh, from him I learned, you know, watch out for briar patches, you know, try <laughs> not, don't get stuck in a briar patch, don't get thrown in a briar patch, and uh, try to always uh, be on your toes and uh, be aware, and um, part of the reason I bring these up each week, these kind of uh, introductions, is because I'm a firm believer that if you're observant, you can learn from everybody, and that children today should be taught to learn from everybody, learn from every experience, whether good or bad, and then in the long run, they all add up to a successful person. So uh, it isn't just school you learn from and teachers. They're very important, but it's every experience you have, and uh, from your dad and mom leading to you to uh, experiences that in your teens as you take up part-time jobs and things like that. So my view was, to learn from people. I learned a lot from people by observing. These people that I talk about, like Ralph Daddio, they didn't even know that I was learning from them, that they were teaching me. It wasn't until years later that I realized the things that I had learned. So having said that, later we're going to put up my other friends, uh, the entrepreneurs of Winstead. Um, first I want to talk about a few things and then we'll put them up uh, in, in the background for the rest of the show. We're going to have them on a few weeks ago and for one reason or another we didn't get them up there, but uh, They'll be there today trying to give me a hand because it's going to be a tough show today with some real hard news, so uh, good news, but uh, um, tough stuff. So now I'm going to put up the first slide, which is um, we have to pay attention. We have to pay attention. As you know, we're in intensive care, and when you're in intensive care, everybody needs to pay attention. I want to start out by saying that, you know, we still have the town problem that I've been talking about for weeks and months, and the pro to that problem isn't going to go away. That problem is we're breaking even, and we have been for 10 years, and meanwhile our infrastructure is uh, not being kept up to date the way it should be, and we're not adding some of the things to the town, to the quality of the town that we would like to add and that, uh, that uh, need to be done. Um, so that... I want to remind you, we still have that problem, and I will keep reminding you that, because the problem, you won't be able to solve the problem unless you really understand that we have it. How long will it last? Well, I did some papers to show that it probably lasts uh, a long time, and uh, certainly for the next three to four years, and then after that, if we're lucky, we may be able to get some revenue in here. If we don't play our cards right, we won't get the revenue then, and the thing could last for another ten years. So we could be in pretty serious... Uh, financial straits here, um, always, of course, hopefully be able to do and uh, get our 3-4% uh, in from the taxpayers to keep afloat, but that isn't going to help us too much with our growth aspirations. Um, how should we proceed? Well, the way we have to proceed is we have to have a friendly environment and a, a welcoming environment to new businesses and new developments that want to come in and add to our taxpayer base, not just the tax base but the taxpayer base. And uh, we need to be very, very, uh, we need to be seen by everybody that wants to come here as very hospitable and very welcoming and very much real in the realization that we know we need them as much as they need us. And it can't be, well, we're doing you a favor by letting you come to our town. It's got to be, let's all work together and let's all be successful together. Upwards pressure. We still have upwards pressure on, on uh, our next year's budget, 208-209 uh, budget. I, I'm not going to put the slide up this week. I've had it up every week uh, since before, and I'll probably put it up again next week. But basically, we're somewhere in a 5 and a 5.5% and a upwards pressure when you take previous debt uh, and, uh, and you take the amount we're going to need for the town for raises and things like that, the normal inflation. So, you know, we're kind of looking at at least uh, – um, normal inflation for next year's budget increase across the board. That doesn't mean we'll have that. Maybe we'll find some way to save some money, 
But I can tell you, there is no magic uh, wand, and there's no big lump of money coming into town. The money will come from the taxpayers, most likely. Uh, I could be wrong, and we'll find out over the next three months. And the other thing I want to remind everybody of is, and I don't think you need too much reminding of this, but the big revaluation, upward pressure that came along, uh, and you all know what that is now. And again, I, I mentioned some of the some of the properties that uh, up in in the lake and other areas of the town made went up hundreds of percent. One of one person told me his went up a thousand percent. Uh, several three, four, five hundred, six hundred percent. So one way or another, there are people in this town. The average person will not get affected too much by the reval, but there are a lot of people who will be affected, and that will uh, those people will vote. So uh, they might be a small percentage of the people, but there'll be a high percentage of the voters, I think. So we need to be aware of that, and we need to pay attention to it. Progress towards additional new profitable taxpayers. As you know, in one of your my uh, programs a few uh, month or so ago, I told you that you know it isn't just growing the revenue that's important. It's growing it profitably. We need to add taxpayers. When we do a reval, all that new revenue comes from the existing taxpayers. So that doesn't really help us out too much as far as uh, our own taxes are concerned. What we need to do is get uh, uh, additional new profitable taxpayers into town. And you can get developments into town that are not profitable. That cost you more money in the long run than they say. So that's uh, something we have to be aware of. Um, we can't really legally, uh, I don't think, suppress that, but we have to be very careful and we have to encourage the ones that are going to be very profitable to try to counterbalance the ones that we have to do that maybe perhaps aren't so profitable. So right now, we're not doing too well in the uh, short to medium term. Uh, all we have basically is the reval. We do have some people coming to town, and uh, things uh, are moving along, but nowhere near at the rate we need them to, to, to improve to be able to uh, afford uh, our needs and wants. Um, we need to concentrate on the hospitality in the short term. That's why I keep hammering it in these, on these programs all the time. And we need to be get, get that good impression to come across throughout the state and throughout the New England and throughout the United States that we are a very hospitable, nice place to be. And uh, we have to overcome some of our natural shortcomings like the terrain and things like that uh, with our uh, personality, so to speak. And uh, personality goes a long way um, if you don't have some other of the qualities that perhaps are needed. Um, and then, of course, uh, in the longer term, there is the possibility of the developments. They're not a certainty for any means, and uh, by any means, and uh, they may or may not ever come to help us. But we're going to try to get them here if we can, and we're hoping that when they do come, they will help us. As far as we're uh, say here is that right now our average um, uh, yearly uh, increase in the grand net grand list has been about 16. Million twenty six four four seven. A lot of that comes mostly from existing taxpayers. The reval being a big part of it. Now it's going to happen every five years. We're going to have a reval. Some years it might go down. Uh, it hasn't in a while, and it probably won't. But you know, we'll find out in five years whether it'll go up or down. I wouldn't count on it going down, although it is a possibility. Uh, we have to have pretty uh, big economic problems uh, for it to go down. Uh, the new intermediate profitable growth, uh, the anything between now and the next four or five years, is negligible, if any. Uh, most of the money we will get from en enhancements and people coming to town and building new houses and businesses will help us achieve the $16 million. Um, and uh, um, it's going to take hard work to get anything else. So I want you to know uh, at the start of this program that we are in tough straits here, and we're going to have to work hard to be able to get uh, improve and get the wants and needs. Uh, the teachers just got a reasonable increase over the next uh, uh, three, four, th two, three years. I saw that. I thought uh, they, uh, everybody did a good job at negotiating and, and understanding our position there. Um, and uh, that's behind us now. But that will be another upwards pressure on the next year's budget, which we will have to achieve uh, one way or another. And then the long term is a possibility, as I said, if we, the town, can help and if the developers are successful, I mean, we always have this concern that perhaps we'll be successful and we'll get them their permits and they'll get their permits, but in the long run they won't be able to pr produce, okay? Now, I'm hoping that doesn't happen. I don't think it will happen, but you never know. So as a town, we have to be prepared. We have to be able to say, how can we grow our existing without the development, if necessary, if that doesn't come. So we have to 
you know, in the future weeks, I'm going to be putting more emphasis on that, especially once we get these permits agreed. Then we'll be concentrating on other things, the short to medium, intermediate term, rather than on the long term all the time. All right, with that, I'd like to switch now the background to uh, my helpers, the uh, entrepreneurs of the earlier days of Winstead who knew how to grow a town and knew how to, how to make it uh, successful. And uh, I want to first start out by saying that last week when I talked about the benefits of the new developments, this is going to be mostly new development stuff for a while here, uh, the new developments, uh, I'm going to provide you with some more financial information now, they, uh, they relied a lot on the Harold Michalowski report, page four. Uh, and uh, basically, um, what they did in their report is they used a thing called the equalization factor, which uh, took 50% of, uh, of the uh, uh, appraised value of houses for their numbers. And in the town here, we used 70%. And that was one of the questions about that report. So I just want to tell you all, I did get some questions this week about it. Um, we are using the town of Winston uses 70%, not 50%. So the numbers I gave you last week are pretty accurate. I did fix a couple of the uh, little smaller mistakes I pointed out last week where I had retyped some, some number of numbers backwards or something. But basically, they didn't make too much of a difference. Uh, so I want to just clarify that for you, that uh, if anybody has any questions about that, you can contact me or somebody down the town hall. But that's basically what that's about. Now, I'm just going to do a quick review of last week for those who didn't watch and those who perhaps uh, didn't uh, get through it. But there's a new, uh, is the second of the Aurora projects is coming in now. Actually, I was corrected this week by the town hall. They said it's not called Winchester Estates anymore, which it was a few weeks ago. It's now called Aurora Estates. Uh, so I've changed it all to Aurora Estates now. And as you can see on this slide, um, uh, the last one was put in. It was denied by planning and zoning because of density. Uh, requirements in the area, and uh, and now the current one has uh, been reduced uh, in some respects. I'll show you that on the, on the next uh, slide. But I did a comparison here of what was on the one before it was denied, and what was on what's on the current one. And the basic difference is the major difference is we lost a lot of what we call uh, restricted age restricted uh, condos uh, or whatever the configuration was at the time. I can't remember. I think it was apartments. The last one. But uh, that takes us a beating as far as profitability is concerned. It doesn't mean it's an unprofitable situation. It just means it's less profit for us uh, because there will be probably be more children in the school system. We don't know exactly yet how many there will be. But uh, we uh, know there will be more because they've changed the ratio there. And the ratio now is what happened was we lost uh, 118 of the uh, restricted housing where it would have two people age 55 and all or over, or maybe more than two people, but they had to be 55, or whatever they were, and uh, or over. And uh, we've gained some unrestricted. We went from 144 and uh, that we had before to 30 plus 33. So we're now up to 177 uh, in the unrestricted area. Now, that I put up last week the overall. I'm skipping a lot of the stuff I did last week just to do a summary here. But basically, we have uh, the total uh, situation of both Highland Ridge Estates and us, which is already approved at our level, so it still needs Army Corps of Engineers and DEP um, at the state level and, and federal level. But um, w if we take that as a given, and it might not be, we might come back and ask us to change the configuration. Uh, but if it's taken as a given now, and it's all we can do, and then we add this new our star, our star, uh, Aurora Estates to it as submitted, that includes the changes they made, then we get like six million uh, in revenue. I'm just rounding it off here to, so I can go quickly. And then our cost per capita, which comes from the Herald Report, and all, all the bottom line is if there are two children in each of these 177 uh, condos, then the profit to the town will be about 2,396,280 just from the condos. There's other uh, revenue, which I'll talk about tonight. Um, the profit, uh, if there are less children in it, uh, because remember last uh, week I had mentioned that maybe maybe during the process somehow we can convince the developer and the town to probably get more age restricted back into this configuration for our estates and get it down to say 85 uh, unrestricted, then we would have less children. Or if even in the 
uh, existing configuration, matter of fact, this is the existing configuration, I got a little confused there, if there's only 1.5 children per family, then our profit will go up to 2,991,000. Um, if there's only one per family on average, uh, it could be 3,585,720. And if uh, only 0.9, which some educators are saying might be the future trend in housing uh, in this area, uh, then we'd be up to a profit of 3,704,664, which goes a long way uh, each year to helping us, uh, uh, that's recurring revenue. So every year we'd be getting that money in to help us with our wants and needs of the town. Now, the last time I also showed uh, what would happen if we could pull off some way of getting more um, age restricted into this configuration. If we did, then our numbers would go up. Um, we would have uh, uh, profit would go up uh, much higher. The, uh, the one for two children would go up to 3,632. The one for 1.5 children would go up to 3,918, almost 4 million there. Um, for one uh, pupil, it would be 4,203,960. And if it was only 0.9 pupils per home with 177 un, uh, un, um, unrestricted uh, condos, then it would be 4,261,080. Now, there is a little bit of controversy here because uh, I think, and I'm not an expert on this, but I, I've been told, and, I, and when I'm in the meetings I hear, that the planning and zoning and the inner wetlands people aren't really supposed to worry too much about the economics of the situation. They're just supposed to make sure that the rules are followed that are in the uh, plan of conservation and development and in the wetlands regulations and all. But sometimes the lawyers for the developers get up and say, oh, no, you've got to take into consideration more of, of the needs of the town as far as the finances are concerned, and that may be true or false, but the jury's still out on that one. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, so I, I don't know exactly what the bottom line is there, but I imagine there'd have to be a big legal battle to, to get to the bottom of that. Okay, now I want to add the new stuff for this week and bring you up to date on the numbers here, and that's why I asked you to pay attention at the beginning of the program, because we really need these developments bad, and you're going to see why here. You already saw how much it would help us just with the uh, condo recurring revenue. Now we're going to talk a bit about the uh, revenue that comes uh, from uh, the sewer usage is additional recurring revenue, the water usage from all these places this is recurring every year, plus and these are non-inflation numbers too. They'll go up with inflation just like everything else does. In one of these programs, I'm going to talk about inflation, um, but not here today. Water is 326, 698. Uh, the golf course uh, I itself uh, is uh, 64,500 in recurring taxes every year, and, and then various am amenities on the golf course. There's amenities. There's a whole list of them in the Herald Report if you want to read it in my green papers down at the City Hall or from the uh, Planning and Zoning or in the wetland area. Um, that'll be another 137,080 recurring every year. So, uh, and then every vehicle, uh, it says in the report, that every house has about two vehicles, so we'll have plenty of vehicles there. They did do a traffic study, and they passed the traffic study. It was done by experts. So uh, we think we're all right in that area. Otherwise, we wouldn't have got the approvals from the town for for the first one. Now it's still juries out on the second one. Uh, but that's another 172598 It comes up to another almost million dollars here, 907052 So that's uh, in addition to the money I was talking about earlier. So um, I've done another slide here for you which shows you the total recurring revenue with all these things put together. And now we're up to, and I'm not going to go through each one, but we're up to $7 million 41,112 each year. And I'm going to show you later what that means to you as a taxpayer, what percentage of taxes you will not be paying if these developments get a, approved and implemented. Remember, they're not even going to start for a few years, and they're going to take them, they say, five years to do. Uh, and I'm saying probably eight. I don't know. Nobody has a crystal ball here, but I take the conservative approach at all times. Um, and uh, it will be... Uh, evolutionary thing, they'll do some each year until they finally get to the maximum number and will all come at once. So 7,041,102. Burn that number into your head. <laughs> Very important. And uh, 
um, may never happen. They may not be able to sell the house. There's a thousand reasons. I could do a whole show on all the reasons why this thing couldn't get done, and I can do another show for an hour on all the reasons why it can get done. So uh, you got to be careful who you listen to on this kind of stuff. And um, later on, I'm going to ask you to go find out for yourself. But now, as far as total recurring revenue, uh, uh, non-recurring revenue, this is revenue that only comes in once. It doesn't come in uh, more than once uh, for the developments. Uh, now, one is housing permits. They need a, a housing permit. It's $15 per $1,000 of, uh, of building costs. And uh, when you work it all out, and it's in the Herald Report, the whole thing comes out to about $1,705,500. Uh, now, what I did here, because we don't have all the numbers in the Herald Report for the new Aurora Estates, I just took 40% of the Highland Ridge number, because that's about what the Highland Ridge uh, revenue, uh, uh, Aurora State's revenue ratio is. So I took that 40, just so we could have a rough idea. Again, these are rough ideas, and uh, nobody has nobody has a uh, absolute uh, positive answer at this stage of the game on any of this. So the housing permits are there. Each sewer, every time you hook an apartment or a condo up to a sewer, is a thousand dollars, and they're going to have 750 or so of these things. So we're, uh, well, it's actually you know going to be. Seven fifty-eight thousand uh, uh, dollars, and that's because of seven hundred fifty-eight of these units between combined between the two developments. And the water hookup is going to be another thousand dollars per household. So you got another uh, a big big whack there. So in the beginning, three uh, million two hundred twenty-one uh, thousand five hundred dollars are going to come in uh, as we go along into our budget. Now. The housing permit, that goes into the normal budget. That goes into the budget that we do every year, uh, the town budget. The water uh, and sewer hookup money goes into the water and sewer uh, budget, which is in a separate profit center. And that money is used to help us keep our water and sewer fees down, to re make repairs to the water and sewer. Now, there are some costs in starting all this up. You have to put a little more plant in there and a little this and that. but. Um, uh, in general, uh, we're going to be making have plenty of money coming in here to help with our sewers and our water. And then in addition to that, we're going to get the usage fees from these 758 uh, um, places. So it's going to be very, very helpful for the town. Now, there's one other thing that's going to happen there, which I'm going to talk a bit more if I can get to it tonight, is that the uh, developers are going to pay to lay the water and sewer lines all the way down to the Torrington Road from roughly around Main Street. I, it's a little farther down, more towards the uh, public works area there. But uh, they're going to lay the pipes all the way down and uh, pay for that. So we as a town will benefit from the fact that we won't have to pay for it. And that happens to be our enterprise quarter. That's where an area where we want to get some of our intermediate money from. Uh, uh, so uh, if we can get that water and sewer pipe down there, uh, we can begin, hopefully, to get more people and more businesses to use the pro corridor and build, build things down there and pay taxes. And that'll help us with our intermediate money that we need until we can get to this quantum leap, which I call the development money, uh, in the longer term. Um, now, the next thing, I can't say too much about this. This is really good news. And uh, if it all happens, um, it's really going to be good for us. So um, let's try to make it happen. now. The next thing that's going to be wonderful for us is that we're going to get, guess what, some more jobs in the area. More jobs, not less jobs, more jobs. Uh, the golf course maintenance will be a recurring another million three hundred eighty thousand uh, coming into the town uh, as payroll money from the development. They're going to pay people to keep the greens up and to run this and to do that and to do the maintenance up there and things. And that's going to be about one million three hundred and eighty thousand. Um, the general construction costs uh, are going to be about seventy-five million dollars. That's one thousand five hundred jobs times fifty thousand salary per year on average, um, and uh, it's going to be fifteen million annually, annually for five years. Now I use five years here. That's because I use that in the mic, uh, in the in the report. Uh, it could be eight years. It could be four years. <laughs> it's not likely to be four years, but it's more like longer term. So that number could be stretched over more than five years. But still, $75 million um, in jobs 
for construction workers and all the kind of people you need to make this thing happen. All painters, uh, you name it, everybody. So that's good for our economy, and that's going to help us out. Now, the next uh, thing where jobs will be is 600 jobs, uh, for, uh, another 30 million for Aurora Estate. That's the new one they're coming through, should it get approved. So if Aurora Estates gets approved, then we're going to have 106 million, 380,000 in jobs in this area for people for over the next five to eight years. And some of them, like the Gulf Coast maintenance, that's forever, okay, and that'll go up with inflation. So uh, it would be better if some of these jobs were forever, but they're not going to be forever. But they'll give a great boost to our economy. And hopefully, once the developments are in and these jobs go away, the development, goods and services side, will provide uh, more jobs for people by increasing the value of, of the uh, uh, people's businesses in the town. And that's what we call in this Mikhail Mikulowski report, this is what they call the induced consumer spending. Now, induced consumer spending is very important to us. And that will make all the businesses in town happy, gas stations, um, people who sell uh, food, restaurants, uh, clothiers. Practically any business in town should benefit drugstores. Anybody here in town um, should benefit from this induced spending. And it breaks up into two different ways. One is the household spending. The household spending will be done as they say in the report, in the Litchfield County area, mostly Winstead, Torrington, won't all be done in Winstead because we don't have, we can't meet all the needs here in Winstead for these people. So they will still go to Torrington for some of their needs just like we do. I go down there too often, to be honest with you, for small items, cost me more for the gas to go down than it does the item I buy. But, uh, and that's Bar Campstead and New Hartford and, you know, Canaan and these kind of places around here. So uh, that'll be... I broke it into two numbers so you could see, 13650000 for Highland Ridge and, uh, Estates and, and Country Club, and uh, for Aurora Estates it would be about 5460000 So that adds up to $19,110,000, and that's every year. That's just not once. That's going to go on and on, and it'll go up with inflation. As we go up 3% a year for inflation, this number will go up 3%. Now, the next one is induced earnings across the state. Again, this comes from the, the report uh, submitted by the developers in 06 into their Highland Ridge uh, application into the public hearing. This is on public record, and anybody can go down and read it. And if you don't want to do that, get it out of my green papers in the uh, town clerk's office and make a copy of it, take it home and read it, and you'll get a, a pretty good understanding of how, this, how uh, the finances in the town are. Um, so the induced earnings, again, I broke it down into two pieces, uh, $88 million. This goes across the state. Um, that the, these are money that, because of this development, that's how much money will be spent across the state. Because we won't just be using local people for everything. We'll be doing, you know, buying things from around the state, using subcontractors from around the state. There'll be a lot of uh, that kind of thing. But that induced uh, earnings for across the state is eighty million, eight million for Highland Ridge, and it's thirty-five million, uh, two hundred thousand for Aurora Estates. Should that get approved and, and implemented over the years, so that's another one hundred and twenty-three million, two hundred thousand. And uh, I'm not quite sure how recurring that um, that number is, but uh, but a certain amount of it will be recurring, of course, because we all go out, we all spend money in various areas, and I, I keep telling people, I. I like to use my own personal experiences as much as possible. Uh, because I've worked all over the world, I get people coming here from all over the world, and I can tell you what they do. They run to the stores. If they come from New York City, they don't go back without filling up their car uh, in one of the local grocery uh, stores. Um, if they come from overseas, England, for example, they don't go back without a new pair of golf clubs, probably some computers. I was just up at my uh, daughter's house in Maine, and her father-in-law came in from Germany, and he loads himself up with cell phones and computers and for his friends and family, and um, there's a lot of that done here, and a lot of restaurant going to, and a lot of purchasing, and a lot of, a lot of, they go to the uh, events in the area, up to the ski slopes, they go to the, 
water parks and, you know, go fishing, they golf and they do everything. So there's plenty of money going to come into the economy. Now, I, I must be honest with you, I don't think there's a lot of people who want this money to come into the economy, and uh, they want to keep it uh, small and peaceful, and I, that's their prerogative, and that's how they should vote, whatever they want to. Now, the other problem we have, and part of the reason I decided to speak uh, uh, here over the year, uh, years is because most of the businessmen have to, they have to be very careful what they say because they do business with everybody in town here, and they don't want to anger anybody. So they keep their own private belief to themselves. But I would say that most of the people in this town want to see the town grow, prosper, and they want to see it get the wants and needs, uh, have the better schools, have the better everything, and uh, be part of, uh, of uh, what's happening here in the, in the world. So um, that's kind of uh, that. Now we're going to get to a very interesting slide. And that slide is where we talk about the percentage, as a matter of fact, there's three or four slides here for this, percentage of annual uh, tax savings uh, eventually, if it all happens, if we make it happen, uh, and the developer comes through, and we've got to make sure that happens, we've got to work with him to make sure he comes through too, uh, then uh, eventually for existing taxpayer, we'll have to pay less taxes. And I did some numbers here for that, which uh, I'll go over with you as soon as I get to my page. Okay, so if we take the, if the option happens as is presented, and there are two, ch two pupils per family, then in the future, we, each individual taxpayer, will sell, save 12% a year. This is a long way down the pike, but and it, it's when the development's done, but we'll save 12% a year if there are two pupils in each, uh, in each of the 177 condos. We'll save 1.5, uh, if there's 1.5 pupils in each condo, we'll save 15%. If there's one pupil per condo, we'll save 18%. That's 18% less that each of you will have to pay for taxes because the new taxpayers will be paying that, per, that burden. They'll, they'll be paying their share, which means two can leave cheaper than one. I'm not so sure that always uh, comes out true, but that's what we were taught when we were growing up, that uh, when we got married, Two could leave, live cheaper than one, and uh, um, that seems to be the case, I guess. Now, uh, if it's 0.9, then it's 18 percent. If it's 1.0 pupils, it's uh, uh, 18 percent. Now, if any educators are out there looking here and they have any better information on the number of pupils for family, and I am talking to them, I'm sending them emails, I'm trying to get information back. But uh, meanwhile, I did double check the Herald report. I looked on the uh, internet with some people that are y used to using the internet into the state databases, and it looks like in, in 2005, the Herald report was pretty accurate, and uh, since uh, the number of people is going down and not up, we should be in pretty good shape here uh, with the numbers we're using as a guide. These are only guide numbers. Okay, if the residential is reduced to 85 unrestricted condos instead of the present 177 during the uh, public hearing in the process or afterward or whenever, if it all happens at all. And remember, it might not be good for the developer to change the 85 unrestricted condos from 177. He may not be able to sell that. He may need to have the uh, restricted con uh, the restrict the unrestricted condos of 177. He may need it. so that we have to live with that. And it's still the point I'm trying to make here. It's still be very profitable for us either way. It'll be more profitable with uh, less unrestricted condos. But, so if that changes, and we go down to 85 unrestricted condos, then we're talking about 18% that you'll save uh, every year on, uh, on your taxes. And if we go to, providing things go the way they're going now, I mean, if we have a great inflation year or something, then that's, you know, it might be a little different. But percentage-wise, it'll still be the same. And then 1.5%. If 19, it will be 1.5 pupils will be 9, I got a mistake on the slide there, 1.5 uh, pupils will be 19 percent, 1 pupil will be 21 percent, and then a 0.9 pupils for each of these 85 uh, unrestricted condos will be 21 percent. So you can see how this will help you and your family. That's money you can spend for your children's education or your retirement or better living for yourself, uh, whatever. Okay? Now, Besides that number that I just gave you, these, these numbers here, then we have to add to that because we had that other additional revenue that I put up on a previous slide. And if we can switch back, thank you. Uh, 
the additional recurring revenue will give us another 1% uh, for each category well, from the golf course, from the personal property, which is usually the vehicle taxes and things like that, and recurring fees uh, will be another 3%. So that's the water and sewer stuff. So now we're up, th that'll be uh, uh, 3 more percent. And then uh, we got the one-time non-recurring uh, revenue of 13%. That's where we talked about getting that $3.5 million in for hookup fees and things like that for water, sewer, and, uh, and all. So, so on top of the, that number, so what I've done now is I put together another slide for you which shows you where, how we total these things out. So you can get an idea what the bottom line is. We like to talk in business about the bottom line. I went over that, I think, last week or the week before. Uh, about how businessmen like to know what's the bottom line and what is it we're headed for, where are we going. And uh, basically the total is, so I've done the total, and I've said if we do have 177 unrestricted condos, as, as has been submitted by the developer for Aurora Estates, then um, uh, when we add all these things together, uh, we get 17%, and then for 1.5, 18%, for 1.0, 21%, and for 0.9, uh, 21%. And then plus, you'll get the one-time 13% um, uh, um, help as well. So we're talking about some pretty hefty numbers here. They seem small, but they're not really when you have to pay the money out of your pocket. And remember, we talked about after-tax earnings. We're talking about after-tax earnings here. So if you, uh, depending which tax, tax bracket you're in, if, say, 17%, you have to pay, then uh, you probably have to earn 25 to 30% or more to be able to pay that 17%. Same goes for the other numbers. So always think of how much you have to earn to pay this tax. Well, that's very important. Um, the next one is, if there are 85 unrestricted condos instead of 177, then the numbers go up. This one goes from 17 to 21. This goes from 18 to 22, 21 to 24, 21 to 24, plus the 13%. So you're talking about some nice uh, numbers there that uh, uh, money that you can use um, to, uh, to, to pay for things in your own uh, family. So let's just think about this a minute. If the developments come into town, um, th they'll help us on our school situation, as you saw on the numbers. They'll help the whole town to be able to get into a better, help us fix up all these old buildings, they'll help us get the schools up to date and the town municipal buildings up to date and all kinds of things that we want to do, get better, more teachers into the school system. We already have excellent teachers, but in, I've heard in various meetings that we'd like to have a few more language teachers or a few more this or a few more that. And we'd like to add to our curriculums and uh, we'd like to be able to get better, uh, better um, aid, training aids and things like that. So there will be money for that if these developments come in. There is no other choice right now. That's why I, I may say at the beginning of the program, we're in tough straits here. We're getting wants and needs. We'll be all right probably uh, if we pay 4% tax each year for the next 10 years. We'll probably be all right for inflation. Can't guarantee that. You know, way back in the 70s there, 80s, early 80s, inflation jumped way up. That could happen again. So we have to be very careful. We keep our eye on that. And now, don't forget, we also have the sword of Damocles hanging over our head, and that one-third of our budget comes from the state every year. And, uh, you know, that could change. I mean, who knows what could happen with that. Um, and if it goes down, then our taxes will go up. That means we'll have even a tighter squeeze and we'll need a bigger shoehorn. So if you're in the shoehorn business, this will probably be the place to sell shoehorns if we have high inflation. Um, now, couple with that, of course, if you can get these kind of savings yourself, then you can spend that money on other things, as I said, your children's education, upgrading your own lifestyle one way or the other, preparing better. You know, we in America aren't too good at savings and saving for our retirement our, on our medical expenses and as we get older, but we're going to need that. And people are retiring later in life. Uh, I think it's my son and daughter, the older two, can't even collect Social Security until they're 68 or 9 now, somewhere in that neck of the woods. So we've got to prepare for that. So. Um, this would be money that you could put aside for that or you could spend uh, whatever you're, you, you might want to do. So the town has that choice and you'll have that choice. We all win. It's a win-win situation. So I uh, can't overemphasize that. 
Now, I'm going to just mention once more the Enterprise Corridor, because that we need for the intermediate growth. And if we can get the developer to pay for that, that'll go in within a year or two of his, within a year probably, of his uh, getting all his permits and getting off the ground. We, he calls it in the ground. We call it, this is off the ground, but that's okay. Uh, if we can get him in, we get that ins insulation, that water and sewer down almost to Torrington, then um, the town line at the developer's expense, that'll save all the new developers from having to do the same. They'll be able to already have it there. They'll have to pay their hookup fees, they'll have to hook, hook up to it, but they won't have to pay to dig it in the ground and put it down, which will in many cases be a deterrent from them wanting to come into that area there. Now, the Enterprise Corridor does have some tax uh, uh, abatements there and things, so you know we might not see as much right off the bat from them as, as, as perhaps we'd like to. They do give some kind of tax break for people moving into there. Uh, but anyway, it'll save on the future developers, and we should be able to shift people into there quicker. This will also allow for future development uh, along the corridor uh, that we so badly need. Uh, that will add up to the number of taxpayers that can help share the expenses of revitalizing the infrastructure of the town. Those people that go into the Enterprise Corridor are going to be additions to our tax base. And uh, there are people down there expanding, that helps too. But getting new people in, new taxpayers uh, with, that are profitable to the town and can provide jobs to the people in the town uh, is one of our main goals. Okay, now I think I've talked uh, quite a bit about that. I've beaten it to death here tonight. And uh, I would like to have a little bit of time now to talk about uh, these public hearings that are coming up in the next few, uh, well, over the month of January. There are going to be two uh, main public hearings, and there's going to be one important uh, or more, one more uh, in a wetland meeting that's important for these developments. Now, I want to say quickly that the, uh, and I'm not going to read all of this because I've only got about eight minutes left, and I want to make sure somehow my own little clock here stopped today, but public hearings, uh, the, the state statutes require that uh, we, ha we have public hearings for many things, especially uh, for adopting uh, amendments and regulations and for certain types of development applications. Uh, these, these developments fall into those categories. So we need a public hearing for uh, Aurora Estates. That's going to happen on the 28th of January in the Hicks Room of the Town Hall. And uh, everybody's welcome to come. Everybody's welcome to give uh, opinions. And everybody's welcome to ask questions. And everybody, more importantly, is welcome to listen to the expert te uh, uh, expert testimony. And uh, as I said in previous meetings, usually people that are against these developments show up. Not too many people show up that are in favor, but, and I'm not even sure if you show up and you're in favor, it'll do much good, but it'll do you a lot of good because you'll learn what the truth is and you won't uh, be affected too much by either the rumors or the propaganda that may uh, be uh, flooding the town. Um, and. Uh, We'll have these public hearings, and uh, they're mandatory, and uh, they're useful, and a lot of good information comes, and a lot of the people who come to talk do make good points, and they do get their ideas incorporated into the, uh, into the planning. Uh, the last uh, Highland Ridge, I don't remember what the final number was, but at the beginning it was like 90 conditions that were placed on them. Some are the conditions that we always place on these things, uh, but uh, there were a lot there that were put in because various people in town did make good points and they were accepted, neighbors and things like that. Now, for these public hearings, the developer does have to put out a registered letter to every neighbor, and, you know, one time they had to call off the public hearing because they forgot to put out or mis misput out some of the uh, letters, so there'll be a certified letter coming to everybody who's a neighbor of this Aurora Estates. And, uh, but anybody in town or the state, for that matter, can go to these meetings, and uh, um, they're very useful. So the public hearing is uh, for the Aurora Estates is on January 28, 7 p.m., Hicks Room Town Hall, and that's the same room that they hold the selected meetings in. And then uh, the regular meeting for the Inland Wetlands is January 16th. 7 p.m. in the Hicks Room Town Hall. Be prepared to stay a while. I don't know exactly where they are on the agenda, but if you go down to the Town Hall or look on the, the Town website, City of uh, Town of Winchester website, you can probably get a copy of the agenda. That'll tell you 
whereabouts these people are on that agenda. And uh, they're usually uh, pretty good about getting these developers up to the front. Not always, as I mentioned last week, but usually. So uh, if you want to know approximately when they're going to be on, uh, but nothing's guaranteed uh, in, the, uh, in either of these meetings as to time frames, how long things will go on. And, uh, um, but, you know, they run very efficiently uh, under the circumstances. Okay, now the next thing I just want to touch upon is the charter. The intent of the, ch uh, there's going to be a revision, uh, not a revision, there's going to be uh, a commission that's going to be looking at a possible revision of the town charter. And uh, the uh, intent of the Charter Revision Committee Commission is to consider changing the town charter from a town manager form of government uh, to an elected mayoral form of government, which is, uh, there has pros and cons to each side of that, and uh, this commission will be looking into that, and they'll make a recommendation to the selectmen. The selectmen will then either uh, agree with that or not. Uh, if they do agree with it, they'll pass it on to town referendum where all the voters in town can uh, become familiar with the uh, change uh, requested and can vote for or against. If the, rest, if the referendum votes yes, then it will be a uh, new charter um, uh, revision. If not, they will vote no, uh, and then it won't happen. And then sometime in the future, if it went towards a full-time elected mayor form of government, then it will be an election and, uh, to elect that mayor. And uh, anybody, including you or I, could run for that, providing we're 18 and a citizen and all the rules that you have to follow. So that public hearing is going to be on January 9th, 7 p.m., in the Pearson School Band Room. Now, this is not the Hicks Room Town Hall. It's the Pearson School Band Room, plenty of parking down there. And uh, it, it'll start at 7 p.m. And what I say here is please come, listen, and politely state your opinions. And uh, everybody will be listening, taking notes, and uh, they'll be recorded, and there'll be a... Uh, uh, I don't know if they will be visually recorded. They'll probably be tape recorded, and they'll probably, there'll definitely be minutes of these meetings. And uh, and then um, you're welcome to come to that and express your opinion and encourage to do so. Now, let me just say about these t these hearings: a lot of people don't come to these. <laughs> Sometimes very important issues get discussed with very few people around, and uh, there's so much knowledge that's available in these meetings that I encourage you, if you can, weather permitting. Now, I will say that uh, when I read the books about Ralph Nader, his father and mother took him to these meetings when he was very young. And he always thought that was very beneficial for him to learn about how the town was run and, you know, uh, certain points like that. So if you want to bring your children and uh, things, I think you're allowed to do that. If they're not 18, they probably can't ask a question, but maybe they can. Uh, check and see at the town hall, uh, town clerk's office, okay? So I won't go through the whole process here because I'm just running out of time. But I do want to thank my mentor, Ralph Daddio, for teaching me the New York way of getting things done. And uh, I didn't follow all his, his, his example. He had a pretty high, uh, um, I guess he had pretty high blood pressure from what I could see of him. But he, he was very successful. I learned a heck of a lot from him. And I thank the two authors for giving us those rabbits because I learned a heck of a lot from them. And, and of course, thanks to my dad for reading me the stories every night. And, uh, and making such an impression on me over the years. With that, I thank you very much. I will be back next week. Ne Monday is the Selectman's meeting. Last week I made a mistake. I thought there was one this Monday, but there wasn't. But next Monday there will be one. So uh, next week I'll be more, probably more or less commenting on that meeting rather than anything else. So let's have a good, successful, amiable meeting with good news for the world to help create this environment for success that we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.